What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Tesla earnings are hot off the press. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. Shareholder letter is out. It's about 5.30 p.m. Eastern right now before the conference call. Um, Tesla stock, as I'm making this, is up about 13% after hours, 330-something per share. It was a huge quarter, absolutely blew away my expectations. Uh, the company posted hundreds in millions of dollars in profit. They produced operating cash flow of $1.4 billion. Revenue was through the roof. I mean, they literally blew away every single expectation I had except for revenue, which honestly was the least important. But in terms of profitability and cash flow, this is the most, this was an incredible quarter. So anyway, without further ado, uh, I want to get right into the numbers and crunch those with you guys. So so we already knew essentially what was going on with Tesla's business in terms of deliveries because this is something they report. Um, they were up 105% sequentially. Tesla delivered over 83,000 cars in Q3. So we knew they were going to have a huge quarter in terms of revenue growth. But then it was, can that revenue growth translate to profitability? And the answer was yes. I mean, this chart is is $6.8 billion in revenue for Tesla, $400 million plus in operating income. I mean, the company was incredibly profitable. As you can see, this quarter is just nothing like anything Tesla's reported, up from uh, 4 billion in revenue and a loss of 600 million just the quarter before. If we compare this to other Q3s um, throughout the years, you'll notice Tesla Tesla actually did produce a profit in Q3 2016, although a very, very small one. But um, I mean, this year over year revenue growth of 128%, there is not a single company on the planet that is this size growing this quickly. Um, and so that it was just incredibly impressive. And then you see the huge swing in profitability from a loss of 500 million in the same quarter year ago to a profit of 400 million this year. Now, the biggest trend here was gross margin. So as you can see, Tesla's gross margin had sort of been in a downtrend since they launched the Model 3. This was hurting their gross margins, but at, as of this quarter, they reported a positive gross margin gap of the whole company of 22.3%, not even just, you know, Model 3 improving, but every single uh, gross profit item on their income statement seemed to go up and to the right. So we've got an incredible improvement in gross margin here uh, at 22.3%. This is the number that really drove the improvement in Tesla's bottom line. Um, additionally, this is the leverage that I've been talking about in Tesla's model. Their SG&A and operating expenses are, you know, they've already built out all the stores. They've already hired the employees. They've already built out all the hard infrastructure. Now they're just selling a bunch more cars. All the incremental gross profit drops right to the bottom line. As you can see, operating expenses actually went down quarter over quarter pretty significantly here. And I mean, just to really put things in perspective, if you overlay the revenue growth rate with the operating expense growth rate, you can see it was already, revenue was already outpacing operating expenses in Q1 and Q2. But then in Q3, we actually got a deceleration uh, you know, OPEX was only up 12% year over year, revenue growth 128% year over year. So Tesla's revenue is growing 10 times faster than its operating expenses. This is the leverage in the model. This is why the company was able to produce a profit of $400 million. And so this is, is absolutely huge. Additionally, we have the energy business here. Um, they reported revenue of 399 million, which was up about 26% um, year over year. Now, a couple more tidbits from the shareholder letter. The Tesla Model 3 was the best selling car in the entire US in Q3 2018 in terms of revenue. That's right, outsold every single car in the country in terms of revenue. If that's not the iPhone moment of disruption, I don't know what is. It was fifth most in terms of unit sales. Additionally, another tidbit was that labor hours on the Model 3 fell 30% quarter over quarter and labor hours per car on the Model 3 are actually less than the Model S and X today, even though there's gonna continue to decrease. So that just goes to show you how Tesla keeps iterating on their manufacturing process to make it more and more automated with each vehicle they produce. Additionally, Tesla mentioned that out of the 455,000 reservations out of August 2017, less than 20% of those have canceled. Um, that means they still have a couple hundred thousand orders on the books for the Model 3. Also, they're going to be taking orders in Europe and China before the end of this year. So it looks like international expansion is coming soon. On the gross margins with the Model 3, for the long term, they are still targeting 25% despite you know this hiccup where they actually over-automated, had to hire more people. That's not changing the margin trajectory. Um, actually, so they posted above 20 20% margins on the Model 3 this quarter already. And they said that when production was over 4,300 units a week, they were significantly above 20% gross margins here. So they're building the Model 3 almost just as profitably as the Model S and X now. Energy storage deployment was 239 megawatt hours in the quarter, eight, up 18% sequentially and 188% or maybe 118% year over year. Um, so huge growth in the energy storage business as well. Now this growth is a little bit constrained because they're so focused on building back 
battery packs for the Model 3. So that's why I'm not too focused on the energy business. Um, additionally, they had 93 megawatts of solar installed this quarter, which was up 11% sequentially. Nice to see some growth there. Additionally, 80% of those deployments were cash or loan sales in the residential segment. So that's up from 46% cash and load sales the same quarter a year ago. Ever since Tesla bought Solar City, they've been transitioning the business off these leases onto cash and loan sales. Now that's by far the majority of their solar business. So that's also a quiet transformation that's going on that I like. They only recorded $52 million worth of Zev credit profits this quarter. So for all those haters who were saying they were only gonna be able to make a profit based on Zev credits, Tesla produced a profit of 400 million. Only 50 million of that was due to the Zev credits. So that was really a non-factor. One little tidbit, which is they uh, have some new tariffs on parts they're sourcing from China. This is gonna impact their gross profit by $50 million in Q4. Additionally, they're reaffirming positive GAT net, net income and positive cash flow in Q4. So this profitability isn't a one-off. It's gonna continue. They've also reaffirmed guidance for 100,000 Model S and X deliveries um, this year, which has been their guidance. And also they guided that production and deliveries of Model 3 will increase from Q3 to Q4. So the fun's not over. That's the bottom line. Really quick, wanted to go through my outlook of what I'm actually expecting for Q4. So I'm looking for revenue about 7.2 billion, a slight increase from Q3 because they're, they're gonna be selling more Model 3s, but they're gonna be selling them for less, um, you know, but the ASP is gonna be a little bit lower because they're not selling as many performance versions. So I think, you know, 7.2 billion, that's what I got for revenue for Q4. I'm looking at about the same number of profitability, 400 million. Remember, they have a new $50 million headwind from China. Addition, they're gonna be selling slightly lower price versions of the Model 3. So I don't know if it'd be harder to make the same level of profits in Q4, but but I think Tesla can easily still be profitable next quarter. Um, and, and, and that's sort of what I'm expecting. That brings my estimates for the full year to revenue of 21.4 billion, up almost 100% from 2017. Operating loss is looking like it's gonna be just around 400 million this year. A huge improvement for 2017, um, despite all of this growth. So Tesla was growing pains. They had to ramp production. They had to spend all this money to get bigger. And even while doing that, improve their bottom line and are getting really, really close to full year profitability, which is on the table for 2019. This is what I'm looking at for energy revenue for the full year. Probably going to come in around $1.6 billion. But once again, the growth on that is muted compared to what it's going to be because Tesla's been so focused on the Model 3. So the last thing I want to say before uh, the conference call, I'm about to get on the conference call right now, and then I'm going to come back and record the second part of this episode, is that this is an incredible inflection point in Tesla's business for the biggest for the, for the reason being that they are no longer reliant on external capital to fund growth. This is the biggest pillar of the short thesis is they need to raise money. They're relying on the capital markets. Tesla always goes back to the capital markets. Well, guess what? It's looking like that has fundamentally changed. Tesla's Fremont factory, the company as a whole has gone from a cash burning asset to a cash producing asset. They're going to be able to fund growth with internally generated cash flow, not raise external cash to fund growth. This de-risks the entire story. This means Tesla can, you know, they don't have to wait for anybody. They can start funding the Model Y. They can fund, you know, the solar roof expansion. They can fund the battery business. They can fund the semi truck. They can fund it all themselves, not relying on bankers. Um, um, this is, an, I mean, this de-risks the entire story. And I think the biggest takeaway, why the stock's up, why this is just the start and we're just scratching the surface of a new era for Tesla is because people have finally realized that Tesla can execute. The, the, the narrative is going from the Model 3 can't be built. It's not profitable. Tesla's a sinking ship towards Tesla outsold every single other car by revenue in the quarter. They produced an operating margin of 6%. They're on the way to becoming the most profitable automaker in the entire industry. What are they going to fund next? Now, the market's going to turn their attention to the Model Y, to the Semi, to the solar roof, start assigning a net present value to those cash flows. Now that they realize they are actually indeed going to happen, that's going to drive the next leg of Tesla's growth. I mean, this is a company that just produced $1.4 billion in cash flow from operations. We times that by four to annualize it. We're looking at a company that's doing $4.8 billion in annualized cash flow. Sure, Tesla's worth, and you know, everyone's confused of why Tesla's worth $50 billion. I mean, if they're generating almost $5 billion a year in cash flow, that's a 10% free cash flow yield for Tesla or operating cash flow yield for Tesla, which is you know, I think is, is justifying means the company's way, way undervalued, especially if you consider the fact that that cash flow uh, power is going to continue to compound significantly as the company grows. So I just think we are at the start of a new era for Tesla. This is a huge quarter that validates everything I've been saying, all the bulls have been saying, every short seller who said they can't make money, said they're relying on the capital markets, got totally proved wrong. And um, I cannot wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for the conference call. Anyway, I'm signing off now, but I'll be back soon to give you the full breakdown of the conference call. See you in a second.
Peace. What up, HyperChange? I'm back. Just got off the Tesla earnings call. It's about 7.45 p.m. Eastern. I'm gonna run down through the entire call. I typed up a bunch of transcript, or I typed up pretty much everything I could from the conference call so we can break it down question by question. I unfortunately didn't get on to go to the conference call. Story time, I'll fill you guys in about that later. Anyway, let's get right into the conference call. So. Elon Musk starts out by thanking all of the employees. This is how he starts every single conference call. He thanks the customers, the employees, the investors. And I don't know, I just think that's super important. And I, and I love that he takes the time to acknowledge the Tesla community um, that is just so, so passionate. He goes on to say the company delivered 84,000 cars in the quarter. That was almost 80% of what they delivered in all of 2017 in a single quarter. That's more than they delivered in all of 2016 for the entire year. Just to put in context how rapid this business has grown. And I thought it was really interesting because this is right around the point where I started realizing that Elon Musk was reading off of a script, or that's what it sounded like. It wasn't his usual off the cuff commentary it really sounded like he, there was a prepared script that either Martin from IR had given him or the board with this whole new chairman drama had given him to actually read out. So a lot more professional with prepared remarks. That's something we haven't seen from Elon. So I thought that was interesting. Model 3, best-selling car in the country in terms of revenue. I mean, that just doesn't lie. Fifth best-selling car in terms of volume. These are the iPhone-like market share disruption numbers that we've all been waiting for. He reaffirms that the company will produce positive cash flow and positive earnings in Q4 of this year, and that they expect to produce positive earnings and cash flow every single quarter going forward, um, despite some sort of huge you know, debt repayment or some sort of one-time expense. He even goes on to say that, that you know there is about a billion debt payment coming due in Q1, and he thinks they'll actually be able to produce flat cash flow during that period. So he's sort of guiding that they're going to be able to have a billion or 1.2 billion in free cash generating Q1. They'll use that all to pay down that loan. That's what a ton of people were concerned about. That was sort of the biggest thing overhang on Tesla's liquidity position. What are they going to do with that billion dollar loan? Well, I mean, they showed this quarter they can make a billion in cash in a quarter. They're saying that's going to continue and it should be no problem paying off that loan. He also gave a huge, really just heartfelt thank you to all the customers who volunteered their time at you know different Tesla stores across the country and at the Fremont factory to help customers get their cars the end of Q3. I mean, how many times do you see people take their time to actually help out a company just because they want to see it succeed? And so I thought it was awesome that he acknowledged that. Huge shout out to anyone who had the who went and helped out and did deliveries. I mean, you are all awesome and Elon gave you a huge shout out. He also notes about how the Model 3 is the lowest probability of injury of any car ever tested. They expand on more of that later. Then he also says that they expect to sell even more Model 3s in Q4 than Q3 and even more Model 3s in Q1 than Q4. So a nice tidbit there that we're going to continue to ramp production deliveries. Now, they go on this huge long rant about vehicle safety, how Teslas are, they try and go the extra mile with vehicle safety, how their car is the safest car on the road. Um, and Elon makes this interesting point about how a lot of car companies try and game the system. They'll try and only reinforce the car at the points where they know there's going to be a crash impact test versus Tesla who, who tries to anti-game the system and get, you know, really test the parts where it's weakest in the car so they can make sure they fortify those parts so it's the safest car on the road. So they're not, you know, hitting all the five-star crash test ratings to check the boxes. They're really going above and beyond to think about how they can make the safest car for you. And that is so, so important. You know, it's not only is safety the number one reason why people buy a car. So economically, it's really smart to have a product that's the safest on the road, but it just, that, that just makes me feel good as a Tesla shareholder to have a company who's pushing the limits on making its customers as safe as possible, not just checking the box. And they go and explain how, you know, the electric car is just a structural advantage in terms of safety over the internal combustion engine. You don't have that massive engine block up front. Um, it's just a much simpler design and architecture overall of the vehicle that makes it able to handle crashes a lot well. And this is why Tesla has been able to put up the safety numbers they have. Elon even makes this joke that's like Newton is on their side. And they had another executive hop on here um, who I guess works in the safety division, didn't catch his name, but he said they are, the, uh, the US government has tested over 900 cars since 2011. The Model 3 is the safest. I mean, that just goes to so. And going beyond that, they're trying to continue to make the car safer, not just from when you get hit, but to even stop you from getting hit in the first place or limiting that impact with the sort of passive autopilot features which could potentially break if you don't realize you're about to get in a crash and they could break before you, et cetera. So Tesla's cars are not only the safest on the road already, but they continue to get safer as the company just improves its technology and autopilot software. Then they end this sort of tidbit on a lot of people think safety is boring, not at Tesla, love that. 
Then moving on, they talk about the autopilot rolling out the most advanced feature ever. Essentially, they're going to uh, track where you are on the highway. It's going to be called navigate on autopilot. You'll be able to uh, change lanes. Originally to start, it's going to ping you and you have to press a button to accept the lane change. But going forward, you could opt out of that. The car will change lanes by itself. It'll know the entire map of the freeway system and it'll just drive itself on the highway until from the on-ramp to the off-ramp. Uh, so that just sounds like a really exciting uh, feature rollout for that V9 autopilot. Then they talk about the hardware three design for the new uh, neural net or autopilot chip. Um, I believe they have Pete Bannon, who is the head designer. He says they've already started to uh, build test versions of the Model SX and 3 with the new chip. They're building out the manufacturing line. Elon chimes in and says that they're going to have a 10x increase in the ability to process different frame rates with this new computer at the same cost with the same power consumption as the old one. Um, and so then he also goes on this little rant about how people shouldn't be waiting uh, until the Model 3 and the Model S and X get this new chip in about six months to buy. They should just buy it now. Um, they're going to eventually swap out uh, the old com NVIDIA computers for this new Tesla chip and that's a really simple just visit to a service center and then you can immediately get that fully autonomous feature uh, and Elon also expands on why they took fully self-driving off the menu he said it was confusing people um, they just wanted to streamline the order process but you can still get your fully self-driving discount if you buy it now that's just an off menu item then they have a I think a director of AI or neural nets come on and he start, started talking about how um, they can't really utilize the full extent or, or c capacity or complexity of their current neural net because they can't uh, the processing power is limited or the bandwidth of their chip is limited and by this new Tesla chip that will be coming on they can deploy these full nets with you know increased redundancy yeah just basically get the most out of their neural networks from this new hardware so that, that was an interesting tidbit um, and you know Tesla is the only company in the auto industry that's building its own AI neural net self-driving chip from the ground up no legacy automakers doing it first of all because they don't have chip expertise they don't have software expertise they're way out of their depth in this but um, just beyond that you know Tesla's a pioneer in building this new type of chip for self-driving cars, you know, this is a moat or, or just competitive advantage that's really, really hard to replicate. Um, so I think that part of the business cannot be understated. And then Elon goes on to say, that eventually Tesla is going to be leveraging what we're starting to see today as autopilot into the Tesla network, have self-driving taxis on the road. He even says eventually Tesla will have millions of cars on the road. They can just flip the switch over the air software update. Every single one of them is fully autonomous. That is a massive competitive advantage that no one will have. The Tesla network will be a hybrid of Uber and Airbnb where Tesla will deploy its own cars on the road and operate them as part of the Tesla network. Or you can tap a button on your Tesla app and have your Model 3 or Tesla start driving people around like Airbnb generating revenue for you. So uh, yeah, and they mentioned this again later, but we'll get to that soon. Then they talk about factory safety with a uh, new executive, uh, Lori Shelby, I believe, uh, the safest cars in the world made by the safest people. They basically say that they're really working on, on factory safety and Tesla really wanted to make a point about this on the on the call and I can't blame them because they said that they even got accused in this massive report, which I remember reading that say they were under-reporting injuries, the Tesla factory is not safe. I mean, that's some FUD that we've all heard. There was a four month investigation on that and apparently Tesla was doing everything by the book. They found nothing wrong. That's the news story that never gets followed up on and I'm looking at you, Bloomberg and CNBC for, for spreading the FUD, not correcting it. But so Tesla has to do it on their conference call. And so, um, the, you know, and, and they talk about how they have doctors on staff. Um, the injury rate at the plant is already well below what Toyota and GM had as injury rates when they operated this same factory. But Tesla, once again, like the safety of their cars, wants to push the limits and make this the safest place to work in the world. Um, and I just love that mentality for the company. So now we get into the Q&A and that was a much longer intro than usually is on the Tesla calls. I mean, last quarter they had a long intro too, but this quarter bringing on a ton of executives they really wanted to use this time when they know everybody's watching to make a point and explain parts of their business that they don't think are getting enough attention i like that a lot q a they start out with wolf research never heard of this guy um he's asked about tight cell supply um you know labor supply and sparks where the gigafactory is is the man pacing supply of batteries jb answers and basically says look yeah supply was tight um but for the model it never really constrained model 3 production and it's not but it's constraining battery production but tesla also has access to third-party battery suppliers if you know in a pinch they need to ramp production because the gigafactory is not there yet but the gist is the gigafactory continues to ramp production and then elon sort of says this thing like we are already making like so many of the world's batteries like we're trying to grow as fast as we can basically um, and then he has martin vieca come on the head of ir clarify say that the the worldwide capacity for evs or for batteries is about 19 to 20 gigawatt hours that's the same amount as tesla built in the quarter so tesla is building about half the world's batteries and then um there's a follow-up about whether they're gonna build batteries in china elon says uh 
long term, certainly not sure about short term. New Street Research, another guy I haven't heard of, um, so says surprised about Model 3 gross margin. What's up with that? Why is it so good? Basically, they say we were sandbagging guidance a little and just did better than we expected. Quick follow up. Uh, they announced, you know, this new mid range lemur car, $46,000, 260 miles of range, sort of out of nowhere. Um, and then Elon basically says, uh, you know, we wanted to, you know, our goal is to, we can't get you the $35,000 car yet. And our goal is to get, make our EVs more and more affordable, make them cheaper, give them to more people. And so this was an interim step to getting to that $35,000 car. It's another, it's a cheaper option. It's a way they could leverage the same pack architecture, but with fewer cells, so they could still get an improved gross margin on that. And so that's a little bit of the thinking behind this new lemur battery. Oh, and then they also, uh, another tidbit that they want to start building uh, cars for Europe in January and shipping them. So your de European deliveries for Model 3 for all you people in Europe are going to start around February or March, and then Asia Pacific or APAC region deliveries are going to start in Q2. Romit Shah, who is the analyst from Nomur, I think, and said, uh, what about, you know, ramp overseas? Honestly, his question was kind of confusing and didn't make a lot of sense. He was basically saying like, do you need to hit a certain level of production at Fremont to be able to start sending cars overseas? They were like, no, we're, that doesn't really matter. Um, and then Elon sort of goes on a rant about how global demand for the Model 3, he sees about 500,000 to a million units per year globally, right in line with what he said historically, 500,000 BMWs, three series are sold per year. And it, Tesla is a much better car. I think they can do, I think they're going to crush that. I think it'll be closer to a million than 500,000, but we'll see. He also mentions they want to build a factory in Europe as well in the long term. And Elon also adds a tidbit bit that they actually want to keep production of the SNX exclusively in California to get the local factories. It's really more important if you want to have a lower price, more affordable car to build it domestically. Um, so that's why they're not going to move production of the SNX to anywhere but Fremont for a while. Evercore. Um, what about 10,000 units per week? Um, you know, you said once you're at 5,000, you have a better picture of the CapEx to get there. What's what's up with that? Um, basically said they're not prepared to speak about that, but they can have very minimal CapEx to upgrade existing lines to get the Model 3 to 7,000 per week. And I have a good insight here because when I was at the factory, I don't know, my gist was that they're just crammed on space. They don't have space to build another production line um, for the Model 3. And so that's why they could, you know, slightly increase their current production lines, go from whatever, 5,500 units a week to 7,000. Um, that seems doable. But the reason why I don't think they wanted to say that right now is because my opinion is they're building out a next generation factory line at Gigafactory 1. I've said this a bunch of times. I'm doubling down on it because I think it'll happen. And not. And now my new theory is that not only just going to build a Model Y there, not only going to build a semi there, but they're also going to start building the new Model 3 line there as well. And that's why Elon didn't answer that, but that's just sort of a guess. Then there's another question about like, uh, you know, you said that the market for European sedans is twice as big as US sedans. Does that mean you're going to sell, you know, how many Model 3s are you going to sell? I don't know. Dumb question. Elon brushes it up, brushes it out. Actually, Martin had to step in basically saying like, we have to sell the car to see what the demand is because Elon's original answer was we've given that zero thought. Anyway, I thought that was funny. Um, Macri comes, um, asks a question, you know, okay, so you're trying to be profitable, but you, you have so many growth opportunities. You know, are you sacrificing any growth opportunities for profit? First of all, hyperchange asks this almost exact question to the T worded a little better on the previous call. Um, and then Elon says the same answer. Basically, are we starving new vehicle development to boost cash flow? The answer is no. Elon says the product he's most excited about and an interesting tidbit is the actual is the Tesla pickup truck. Um, so I thought that was really cool because that's something I'm excited about as well. Pickup trucks are a huge market. Ford sells like 900,000 uh, F-150s a year in the US so or F-series trucks in the US. So huge market for the Tesla pickup. Um, they also want to do volume production on the solar roof beginning in Q1 2019. They keep kind of pushing this back with the same excuse that like testing a roof with a huge warranty just takes a long time. Um, additionally, it's they got to figure out a really efficient way to install these once they hit scale. So still working out kinks with the solar roof. I mean, it's coming. It's going to happen. It's going to be a game changer. It's just taking longer than expected. Um, they also, Elon also goes on to say like, we have the most like exciting product roadmap of any company on earth. Like I can't think of another one that's more exciting. I love that. Too. I, I agree a million percent. And actually I could think of a company with a more exciting product roadmap, probably SpaceX. But anyway, then the next question is, is your long-term plan to build a platform to turn the car into application? Should we be thinking of revenue sharing model? Like Apple takes a cut of the app store. Elon says this kind of like interesting mantra of like, we try and do things that are useful. Um, if there's a way third parties could do something that would be useful, we'll do it. Um, 
but but he doesn't know and then he goes on to double down saying i mean what i do know is that tesla will be operating its own ride sharing network just like uber and lyft we're going to be going head to head with them um, customers can add or subtract their car to the fleet so he's really doubling down on the tesla network there was a lot about it on this call then our, our boy adam jonas comes on asks about who the new chairman is elon says we can't answer that then asked about trade-ins uh martin comes in and says we're seeing the more than half of the cars trade in for model three are cars that are sell for less than thirty-five thousand dollars brand new people are are what is called the Tesla stretch. They want to spend more than ever on the product because they really care. They believe in the mission and it's just an amazing car or just vehicle for maximizing fun. So that's why people who have never spent this much money on a car are spending it um, on Tesla. Mass market premium. Thought that was good. Um, also, he says that uh, in the third quarter, then Adam Jones goes on, is the third quarter a milestone? Are you going to be sustainably funding from here on? That's sort of already reiterated in the call, already re reiterated in Hyperchange's previous uh, question last quarter. But he, uh, the question is, yes, that's our goal. We don't intend to raise capital, et cetera, et cetera. And then Elon says, this is actually one thing I forgot. Um, forgot one thing. This is why it's good to have crisis situations. They basically, he goes on to explain that in August, it was taking Tesla 30 days to, for a car to leave the factory to get to a customer. Now they got that down to 20 days. The goal is to get it to down to 10 days. Um, and then he makes this interesting tidbit that we make $75 million worth of cars every day. If we save 10 days of like inventory that we don't have to put up because we're getting the cars to customers 10 days faster, that's $750 million. Uh, and then he goes on to explain why this makes, is why local factories are so important so we can reduce these delivery times. And this is building on the point that Ron Barron brought up in the video I made analyzing his CNBC interview um, where he really doubles down this, this theory of float. Tesla is going to get paid for its cars from customers way before they have to pay suppliers. And that's a trend that's going to keep going in their favor as they get better and better terms with suppliers. They get more mature and they're reducing the time from the car leaving the factory to delivery. So this is a, and, and Elon sums this up beautifully is we're going to do, what we're doing is reversing the working capital model of the company. The faster we grow, the more capital we have. This is why every short seller is pointing to the gap in account payable, receivable, etc. They don't get this because they're just ignoring the positive float nature of Tesla's business. And this is just, I haven't fully wrapped my head around why this is such an interesting theory or, or you know, why it really makes a difference other than the fact that Tesla needs less capital to grow. Um, but I, I think this is a really important tidbit. So I encourage you all to think about it. Also, Tony Sakanagi asked about operating expense growth, which is really strong, basically saying like, and then Deepak's answer is what Hyperchange has been saying the whole time, which is like, look, Tesla, they already built the stores. They already built the superchargers. They already hired everybody. Now all this incremental profits dropping to the bottom line. I guess the Wall Street analysts had to ask about it because they couldn't figure it out. Then Sokanagi goes on to his next question about what's the gross margin today if you built the $35,000 Model 3. They don't really answer it because it's too hard to answer. But previously in the call, Elon mentioned that they could start building the Model 3 at a gross margin they want in about six months. They want to get the cost of that $35,000 card about 28 or 30 grand. Consumer Edge um, asked something about where they're putting the cost of the logistics of that, you know, delivering the cars, which line item is that in. Elon talks, but then this, they go into this whole accounting discussion, which honestly didn't really matter at all. Um, and then that was pretty much last question until they let Phil LeBeau on, who's the only media person. Um, and he basically asked like, will the federal tax credit slow sales? This is the one person from the media that Tesla let on. I mean, I get it, he's from CNBC, but like just the, it just, the lack of critical thinking, the lack of understanding Tesla's business, the lack of doing your homework to ask this question out of the one chance you get to talk to Elon Musk and the Tesla executive team is just embarrassing to me or like embarrassing that that's what CNBC does. I don't know. Anyway, I thought it was a horrible question, but it was last question as the federal tax credit slow sales. Um, they're like, well, maybe slightly in the US, but then we're going to start delivering to Asia and Europe. And, 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 you know, so we don't see a problem where like our demand gets ruined overnight because the tax credit goes away. And then the follow-up question is, well, will it slow down demand in the US? And then Elon basically answers, well, maybe slightly, but as we offer lower and lower cost models, we still expect demand in the US to continue to increase. Um, and then says something like, oh, you actually triggered something for me to think about. Um, the most We make the most efficient energy per mile EV out there. So we have the best in terms of miles per kilowatt hour and the lowest cost per kilowatt hour. This makes it very other difficult for other car companies to compete with Tesla. So I, I probably didn't say that right, but basically he's, he's explaining how he, uh, the vertical integration of the Gigafactory is so, so important to bring the cost of the Model 3's battery down. Um, and he was saying, he goes on this interesting rant of saying like, I told our competitors they would have to make this investment. We did the, invest it in the Gigafactory. That's our competitive advantage. I told them they could use our patents. I told them they could use the supercharge network. We want to be as helpful as possible. But the fact of the matter is they didn't make the investment in the Gigafactory and that's our competitive advantage. 
I, I loved it. I mean, when Tesla was building Gate Factory, nobody thought it was a good idea. It was just a pile in the sand. They were spending billions of dollars for battery technology. It was going to be obsolete. Every expert, every analyst, every person in the media thought it was a horrible idea. And that turned out to be the fund, fundamental competitive advantage of Tesla, which is why they reported this blowout quarter. So that is the thing I would, that's, you know, I'm sort of on one, as you can tell, but like, that's the biggest thing about this whole quarter that's made me realize is like, I didn't go hard enough predicting the bullishness of Tesla. Like I let the skeptics start to infiltrate me. And it, it, like the only way I was wrong is that, I don't know. It's just like everything that the skeptics view as a negative in reality, when you think about it was actually a positive and a smart move. And just, I don't know, the fundamental disconnect in the logic analyzing Tesla leading up to this earnings report was mind boggling. And that's why everybody was so surprised is because like, People are saying like, oh, Tesla's taking on billions of debt to build this factory. It's going to be obsolete. It doesn't matter. Why are they doing this? It's so dumb. It's a bad thing. It's a weakness in their business model. They're vertically integrated. They're tied down to this battery technology. And yet now three years later, that's the reason that they're going to put everybody else out of business. So remember that. Anyway, the next thing is um, that's it. So that's the end of the call. And Deepak sort of cuts off Elon right before the end and says, we want to personally thank all of the Tesla employees who have worked so incredibly hard. The results that we did are our passion, our, our result of people working passionately against all odds to achieve the mission. So a really heartfelt thank you from Deepak to the customers, to the investors, to the employees who believe in the product and mission. And I, and I love that part about Tesla. They really, really thank everybody. And just it's just a feel good moment. So, you know, that wraps up the call. As you can tell, I'm a little bit frustrated by the Q&A part because I didn't get on. I was talking to Tesla a little bit during the day. They said I might be able to get on. And then at the last minute, I didn't even get an invite to dial into the call, which was a bummer, but it's, I don't know. I'm not, I'm bummed because I think I could have asked questions that were much better than any question asked on the call. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I have, I have, I got hundreds of probably over a thousand people messaging me in just the past 48 hours with no notice to, to help me get a question or questions for the earnings call. So I was totally ready. I had my list. I hit up the IR. I tried to get on the call. Um, and, and I just got an email saying like, we'll try to get to your questions at the end. Can you just email them in? So I emailed them in. Um, and so I guess they covered some of it. So it is what it is, but I'm, I don't know. I also just want to say thank you to all the hyper changers who emailed Martin in previous quarters to help get me on the call, who, who, you know, who vouch for hyperchange. It means so, so much. And I'm a little bit bummed that I didn't get on the call, but at the end of the day, it just doesn't matter. Like this was such a feel good quarter for Tesla. I mean, they blew away my personal expectations in terms of profitability. They proved all the naysayers wrong. This is the biggest inflection point. I mean, this is the moment. This is the, this is it for Tesla. They went from a cash burning asset to a cash producing asset. I mean, now we can all focus on, on the exciting and world's most biggest, like now we can all focus on the world's most exciting product pipeline starting to take shape. I think we are just scratching the surface of seeing Tesla's success and growth as a company. Like they look big now. You think 50 billion is a big number. It's not going to look big in a couple years from now. Um, and it's because of things like the Model Y and the semi truck. And so I, I, I don't know. I think this is a, this is. I'm totally surprised the stock is still only at like 325 or 330 per share. I thought it was going to be way higher than that when I read this report, but we'll see what happens tomorrow. Anyway, this is the Tesla earnings call. This was the quarter we've all been waiting for. Tesla is a profitable company. They have the number one best-selling car in the entire country by revenue. The iPhone moment is here. The world is going electric and it's all because of one uh and it's all because of one company, Tesla. If you're supporting, if you're a customer, if you watch Hyperchange, you should just feel really good today because it's just a proud moment and exciting moment and sort of coming of age for the Tesla story. Um, and I couldn't be more excited about the future. So thanks for tuning in. Um, huge shout out to all of our Patreon supporters and producers. Thank you so much. Definitely check out our Patreon page if you wanna consider supporting the show. Please let me know all of your comments about the earnings call. What were your reactions? What was your favorite part? Any tidbits from the letter I missed? Leave it below. Anyway, I'll see you guys next time. Peace. <laughs>